I really think that almost every election is about what issue is the most salient at the end. You know, if like if the 2016 election is two weeks earlier, Hillary Clinton probably wins. If the salient issue in this election at the very end is something to do with immigration, we're probably not in a great place. If the Gaza war is still raging, we are absolutely screwed. But I think you will start to see more and more people feeling better about their economic situation. So I, I, I have confidence that uh, all is not lost, that we have time to make the argument. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. You may have noticed everyone has spent the last few weeks parsing the numbers of people voting against Donald Trump and Joe Biden in the primaries. In some recent primaries, Nikki Haley is still polling 10 to 20 percent of the vote, which means there are a decent number of Republicans showing up just to vote against Donald Trump. I love that. But there's also a smaller but still meaningful chunk of Democratic voters showing up just to vote against Joe Biden, most notably to protest his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. The most notable example of this was in Michigan, where uncommitted, which was a line on the ballot, pulled in 13 percent of the vote and more in places like Ann Arbor or the Detroit area. And in other recent primaries in Wisconsin and New York, we saw very similar efforts. So we had to talk to a group of these uncommitted voters for Michigan and see what clues they are leaving us for November. My guest today is Tommy Vitor, co-host of Crooked Media's Pod Save America and their foreign policy podcast, Pod Save the World, and someone who can help us sort through the roots of the uncommitted vote and what the Biden campaign can do about it. But also, this is the first time I've had a fellow Kenyan graduate it's great on the podcast. I love it. Uh, long time listener, first time talker, but uh, <laughs> excited to be on the show. So Tommy, um, so Tommy and I were in the, not just, we didn't just both go to Kenyan. We were in the class of 2002. We were mm -hmm. both O2ers. Um, and I have a confession to make that I've held on for a moment just like this, that oh, I've been God. waiting to say to you. God help me. So when we were freshmen in college, uh, there was a guy on your soccer team named I was a good friend of mine. I didn't play soccer, but a good friend of mine. And he used to borrow my car with a full gas tank and then return it completely. We empty. stole your car. This was I was with him. He and I stole your car. We drove it to Wittenberg and we stole their dry erase markers. Uh and, and yeah, we returned it with no gas in it. Um, and every time when we, cause you and I, you were like a history major. I was a political Philosophy, science major. Yeah, same shit. I, I have none of your stats down. <laughs> I <laughs> thought you fine. were, that you were a soccer playing history major. Yeah, you know, and, the company you uh, keep. So, but so when people would be like, and so you started getting famous and people would be like, um, oh, do you know Tommy Vitor? You went to Kenyon. I'd be like, yeah, I know Tommy Vitor. I stole his car once. And that was like my, that was my one story that is so funny like he ended up leaving kenyon i think after freshman year but he's a buddy of mine and he would just i was like the one idiot who had a car and i'd loan it out to everybody because i was young and stupid and yeah he would drive to cleveland and come back and it would just be bone dry like i could barely get it to the gas station so <laughs> thank you for that and you know yeah. how broke you are you're like scrounging through the couch like figuring out how to fill this thing up that's right. That's right. Uh, so anyway, I've owed you. That's a 20 year late apology for that. Yeah, it was like $1 gas at that point. So we're fine. <laughs> gas was cheap back then, <laughs> man. Cheap. How times have changed. Okay. So I want to get into how the voters have been talking about all this, but I want to make a caveat first. So this is an electoral punditry podcast where we listen to focus groups. Uh, and so I'm not going to pretend that I have the complexities of this war nailed down in Israel and Hamas. You, though, we brought you here because you're a foreign policy guy. Um, and I want you feel free to talk about it in whatever terms you want, in moral terms, in your own, you know, have your own analysis. Um, but I can basically I'm, I'm probably only going to stick to the consequences for the election yeah. because I'm just not a foreign policy expert and I want to get that out there. So. We're going to get to the Michigan uncommitted group in a little bit, but we also did a focus group with Gen Z progressives recently. Uh, and if you listen to my TikTok episode with Andrew Egger uh, a couple weeks ago, you can hear more about it. Um, but I wanted to, we save some of that tape from that episode um, for this podcast, because I want to listen to how the Gen Z group talked about the war in the Middle East and how they thought about a possible third party in November. Mm. There's a lot of things you can say about Trump and the things that he's done but he's never financially supported a genocide 
And that's one of the big things about why a lot of people don't really want to vote for Joe Biden a second time. That's why I don't really want to vote for him a second time. It's just the fact that like people have been screaming for months that this isn't what they want their tax dollars to go to. Like that one interview he did when he was like eating ice cream, just nonchalantly talking about how he was just going to send more money over there. Like it just seems like he was not the same person he was when we first voted him into office. Now that there's this huge conflict in Gaza, you know, it's brought so much attention to it. So I think my only like counter argument would be like, it's so in the forefront now, like there's literally genocide happening. You would hope maybe he would be the change and do something about it as opposed to past presidents. So there's obviously so many issues a president has to consider, but I feel like this one is like an insanely big deal. Like thousands of people are dying. So yeah, it's definitely not helping wanting me to help vote for him but i'm also vehemently i will never vote for trump i'm sorry if you think nothing can change either way and you're going to be voting for like the you know more evil person then at least you can just i don't know stay true to your morals and like keep your own personal integrity i would still vote third party just because i am kind of inspired by the election that happened a couple weeks ago in Michigan where like they were trying to pick the primary, I think it was. And a lot of the Arab vote voted uncommitted in protest for what Biden was doing. And I think if enough people did uncommitted or a third party candidate in protest, I think it would at least make a difference a little bit. I, there was still a possibility that Trump would be elected, but I think just showing them that we're not going to fall into place and be complicit just because he's the lesser of two evils is super important because complacency is kind of silence. So I'm just going to note that for this Gen Z group, a lot of them were from states like California or New York. And so they're, they, they acknowledge that their calculus around mm-hmm. sort of third parties was, was different if you, than if you live in Wisconsin. But how concerned are you about this thing that, that and I'm sure you – talk to more progressives than I do, even with the focus groups that I do. So you must hear a fair amount of this. How do you feel when you hear people sort of say, like, they're not that different or Biden, what Biden's doing makes him worse than Trump or sort of drawing these equivalencies um, or feeling like it's a moral choice not to vote for Joe Biden, even if it allows Donald Trump to get elected? Yeah, I mean, listen, I I think You know, it's one of the challenges of incumbency because you are responsible for all of these problems in the world and uh, you get, you know, a a, a fair amount of the blame, actually, in this case. I think, you know, Donald Trump has started to do more interviews where he's been asked about Gaza. Um, I think his answer has been kind of a Rorzak test uh, and people hear what they want to hear. He basically says you got to finish the job. You got to end it quickly. And they have bad PR conservative. Uh, The conservative Israeli journalist who interviewed him thought that was a catastrophic answer, that he had abandoned Israel, et cetera. I heard that and I heard him wanting to take both sides of the issue and saying, well, you're going to finish the job, which means going into Rafa and, uh, you know, more war, uh, but also do it quickly. Um, So, you know, again, it's a classic Trump. I should just say for your listeners, just full disclosure, um, uh, my, my view on this war is that it's been a moral, strategic and political uh, disaster. And I felt that way for months. The moral piece of this is just that you have thousands of children that have been killed. And I worry that you have a generation of people on both sides that are being radicalized and that Hamas is standing in the world is just getting elevated. And I worry that some other terrorist group will say that the United States and Israel are equally to blame here and they will target us because of what's happening in Gaza right now. And then the politics of this, you know, sort of what we're talking about today, my fear is that Uh, On the one hand, it's dividing the Democratic Party uh, at a time when obviously we need to unify in advance of an election. But also, I think there have been times where President Biden has looked like an observer of events and not someone who is acting to shape them. And I think that is a problem that cuts across both parties. You know, since you sort of laid out your position, um, I guess, uh, what do you think Biden should do right now? I mean, so Hamas... And this is, again, I'm going to just stipulate my lack of expertise in this area, but I guess my my sort of normie, center-right, unrepentant neocon uh, take <laughs> is that, like, Hamas is still holding Israeli hostages. Um, and, you know, I 
I I think I, I have been shifting uh, as I see things like the the strike against the World Central Kitchen, um, people who are just trying to get aid, seeing that as both leading me to have concerns about the way um, Israel's prosecuting the war, but also just from a um, like a like it was like that's a that's a bad mistake. Yeah. Um, that is like if if they're just screwing up like that, like uh, I'm worrying that they have some tactical deficiencies. Uh, but I also like what what is Joe Biden supposed to do? I genuinely, if I were him, he's in a this is not an easy situation for him. No, it's not at all. Uh, I mean, I think look, there any country uh, in the world on October eighth would have started planning or launched some sort of military response to what had happened. If you think back to those days, I mean, rockets were still being fired into Israel. As you noted, uh, there were hostages who had been taken or being held in the Gaza Strip. So I, I don't begrudge Israel for, you know, doing what they can to degrade Hamas's capabilities, trying to take out the rockets like as they were still being launched at them uh, and to do what they can to try to make sure that, you know, Hamas can't repeat this kind of attack. But what I think we've learned over the last six months is that um, the only way Israel has gotten back hostages has been through a negotiated ceasefire agreement. We saw that happen early on. A lot of hostages came back. Um, since then, it does seem like the negotiations have been too narrow. Obviously, you need to get Hamas to agree to that, to a ceasefire agreement. And then that is not easy. But I, I do think like the Israeli side has to be willing to to give more if their goal is to get the hostages back, because I think there is a greater risk of killing these hostages as this war goes on or of them dying in captivity or being killed by Hamas than there is of rescuing them. We There's this horrible incident when three hostages escaped. They were waving white flags and yet they were shot anyway. What has been lacking in the U.S. approach on this policy for years, not just in this case, is a carrot and a stick approach where it's not just total backing of the Israeli side with, you know, support of the United Nations, with weapons shipments and with military aid, there is some sort of stick approach where you say, if you do the following things that we don't like, there will be consequences in the form of you name it, you know, cutting off supplies of certain weapons. Uh, you saw Biden abstain at the vote at the UN the other day on a ceasefire resolution. So they're starting to take some of those steps. I just think you could have taken them earlier. Yeah. And I also, just from a voter's point of view, so sort of uh, me being neutral on the the content, but like if you're one of these voters for whom it is deeply important to see Joe Biden shift his position on Israel, I'm not sure him abstaining from that vote is like the kind of thing breaking through no. uh, to these voters. I think the thing that you said there about Joe Biden seeming like an observer as opposed to the person in control feels very consistent with what I hear from focus group participants uh, who are Democrats, um, certainly progressives, where and, and and it actually just in general, I would say they're the big criticism you hear from people about Joe Biden is kind of the where is he? I want him to be stronger. Like there is um, I don't want to say it's a desire for their own strongman, but they do have their desire for their own fighter. The yeah. Democrats do. And I think it's been tough for Joe Biden to embody that uh, one way or the other. But like, uh, well, actually, you know what? You know who else agrees with you are these uncommitted voters in Michigan. So let's listen to them and we'll keep talking about it. Um, so uh, we'll just like let's listen to the these uncommitted voters talk about why they voted that way in Michigan in that primary. I feel almost no connection to the Democratic Party. I've been just personally so disappointed in their actions. And I didn't know that voting uncommitted was something you could do until very recently. There was the Listen to Michigan campaign. So many amazing organizers that put that together so quickly to mobilize people in support of Palestine. And that's an issue that's really important to me. So one, I wanted to listen to the people who were doing the work. I couldn't stomach putting his name down on the ballot. It didn't sit right with me. And I don't think that's how voting should feel. The reason I checked uncommitted this year is because I'm more of a Bernie Pratt. I'm kind of independent and lean more with the progressive values. And I just felt that, unfortunately, with Biden, it feels like there's that inequality again of everyone between the rich and the poor. The gap keeps widening and we don't see a lot of these big corporations being reined in. 
over the last like decade, probably I've moved farther left and don't really consider myself a Democrat anymore. Like I'm a fairly active member of my local DSA chapter. You know, I know a lot of the people who were organizing for the uh, Listen to Michigan campaign. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense. Like I'm 100 percent. There's no other option. This is the only time when like anyone will ever see that vote and actually do anything about it. You know, if that vote didn't matter. I don't think that you would be paying all of us to sit around and tell you why we voted that way. I think that hopefully people are listening to that and a bit worried by that. Like what Aaron Bushnell did really like triggered a lot of things for a lot of us. That's been like weighing very heavily on at least for veterans, um, a lot of our like past actions and how we have like the things that we've done and how we're trying to like prevent things going forward with that. Well, my original vote for Biden was to get rid of Trump. Plus, I am a very liberal Democrat, so I do typically vote Democrat. Not to say I wouldn't necessarily do something else, but yeah, it was to get Trump out. And as far as voting uncommitted, like I think Mary said about the uh, Dearborn starting that campaign to vote uncommitted if you didn't agree with what was going on with the Israeli-Palestine conflict and using taxpayer money to send weapons to Israel to annihilate civilians. I voted uncommitted to stand with the people who in in Dearborn who started that whole thing about voting uncommitted. I voted uncommitted to stand by them and I would have voted for Biden otherwise. I do think that he should um stand stronger in having Israel not wipe out the Palestinians, because my feeling is that's what they're going for, to totally decimate that country, wipe out its genocide. Okay, just a couple quick notes. So Aaron Bushnell, who was mentioned by one of the gentlemen, is uh, the young man who set himself on fire in front of the, um, he committed suicide by setting himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy. Um, and and then the last couple of women, several people mentioned Dearborn, which was the official sort of campaign to get people to vote uncommitted specifically on this issue. And that had a substantial um, Dearborn itself uh, in Michigan has a substantial Arab American population. Weirdly, that demographic, when we were trying to screen for that group, we didn't get hmm. uh, Arab Americans uh, in the group. Like, that's just not what they were able to pull for us because, you know, sometimes when we screen, we get what we get. Um, but it seemed like that, but many of them identified with that campaign. Like that campaign was what led them um, to vote uncommitted. So here's the thing, Tommy, my optimistic mm -hmm. take with the uncommitted votes is that they've been taking place in Michigan and other democratic primaries because it gives people an opportunity to like, I don't know, I don't, blow off some steam sounds glib, but I mean like register their dissatisfaction um, and that, but doing it at a time when like it doesn't elect Donald Trump, mm -hmm. um, do you think that's it? Or do you think these folks, do you think it's message sending in like a short term way? Or do you think these people are saying, I will not vote for Joe Biden over this, even if the outcome is that we reelect Donald Trump? I mean, I think certainly your group, the, all the folks in this group, uh, it seemed like message sending and frankly, like a pretty smart, sophisticated way to send a message. It, it you know, there is there is this sort of there is the concern about electing Donald Trump. Uh, and all of these folks were quite aware of it and they didn't want to do that. And so I think they, they viewed this vote as a, a way to be heard, uh, in the near term about an issue. I do think that there will likely be voters in places like Dearborn who lost family members, uh, and who will never vote for Biden in this primary and might not vote for Democrats again. But I, I don't know how large that group is, but I thought, what was interesting about this sample was these just didn't seem like they were necessarily strong Biden voters to begin with. I mean, one guy said his 2020 vote was between eating rat poison and moldy cheese. I thought yeah. that, you know, was illustrative. It seemed like a lot of them had ch issues that went beyond Gaza. Like uh, there were you know, the just very progressive woman at the top who explicitly said I voted un uh, uncommitted because of Gaza. But others had a bunch of challenges. And there was this interesting element of. A lot of them said they wanted to stand up for people in the community of Dearborn that they knew and stand in solidarity with them. So it was it was an interesting note. You know, it wasn't people who were personally affected, but they wanted to stand with those who were. 
Yeah. Uh, but again, I guess, so th- you mentioned that woman at the top, the young woman. So she was one of the people, and I would say in the Gen Z TikTok group, uh, that thing, that 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 group's really stuck with me. It left a real impression on me mm. of these sort of young progressives because they had all voted for Biden in 2020. That whole group had of, uh, I can't remember whether it was eight or nine people, but about half the group wasn't going to vote for Biden. Um, and when we asked this group whether they would vote for Biden, um, a majority of the group said yes, but she was one, uh, and she was a, a, I can't remember the name of the group that she was name checking, but it's essentially, uh, she is herself Jewish, mm-hmm. but uh, advocates for peace uh, right. in Palestine. Um, and she was one who was really like, I might just stay home, uh, even if that elects Donald Trump. And I guess just as, I think you care deeply as I do about making sure that Donald Trump is not the next president of the United States. Um, what do you what do you say to people for whom this is like a personal moral issue, like a personal moral red line for them? And yet, uh, obviously, there's so much at stake in terms of voting for Biden. Um, like, just h- how do you think about how you motivate these people? Because that, that 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 young woman, she kind of was doing this like, uh, like that that thing that you do with your hand where you wave it yeah. up and down, like yeah. uh, maybe. But he, she said if the election were held today, she'd stay home. Uh, so how do you handle that? First of all, President Biden needs to do whatever he can to get a permanent ceasefire in place and just end this conflict. And th- this is sort of goes to the challenge of his strategy today, which the Biden President Biden had this uh, what he called a hug BB strategy where he just wanted to support him publicly, like literally flew over to Israel, gave him a big hug, like stood side by side with everything he did and keep all his grievances and frustrations and fighting in private behind the scenes. And I I understand the theory of the case. They thought that that was the better way to actually get Netanyahu to do what he wanted to do. But, you know, unfortunately, then you don't see if you're this young progressive, you don't see Joe Biden screaming at Bibi Netanyahu on the phone, demanding a ceasefire, right? All you see is the public messaging where they're standing side by side. So I think that strategy was a mistake and it's time to move away from it. And I think they have. But I do think that has to be more substantive. They have to get to a ceasefire. They have to stop just greenlighting arms sales day after day after day because people read that and and anything you say is completely undercut. Um, My message to the folks in this group, I mean, I think like, Listen, there there will be some people in places like Dearborn who are like, I lost 11 cousins in Gaza. And like, I just, you, you're not going to convince that person. Um, I do think, though, it's worth hearing them out. It's agreeing that, you know, there needs to be a course correction. And once that happens, highlighting what has changed to them and what Biden has done to get aid into Gaza, to save lives, to end the war. But also just make clear to them that during the Trump administration, he did literally everything Bibi Netanyahu wanted. He set back Middle East peace process and a two-state solution and the creation of a Palestinian state by years and years and years. They, they, I won't get into all the dorky details, but essentially like he just gifted Netanyahu all these political wins because he thought it might help him both with evangelical voters and with certain members of the Jewish community. Um, So I would point that out. And then also, I think you just have to broaden out the argument because, you know, if you're talking about Biden's concrete record in Gaza versus a hypothetical about what Trump would do just feels soft. You know, it kind of feels like a vote blue always kind of argument. I do think you have to broaden it out and say like, okay, do you care about climate change? Do you care about abortion access? Do you care about, you know, fill in the blank and just make it a bigger conversation? Because right now this is just like too deep and too personal and painful for a lot of people. And also let's just be honest. I mean, if you're, a young, if you're a 25 year old progressive and all your friends are talking about all the time is Gaza and the horrors of what's going on there and how angry they are at the Biden administration, that matters too. You know, there, like there is, I, I don't want to dismiss that as, you know, a, sort of an unthinking um, point of view or place to be, but like it's hard to cut against the crowd in this moment. I think people need a little space to sort of like, grieve and and see some improvement and then be able to have this bigger conversation. Well, since you brought up this idea of like asking what, you know, what would Trump do in this situation? How, what was his relationship with BB like? We asked that, Um, you know, so one of the keys to breaking down the sort of uh, 
because they do. It's not a, it's not that they have an equivalence with Trump, these voters. It's more that they are so upset at Biden. Yeah. And because they when they're focused on this idea of in their minds, this is a this is genocide and it's genocide that the American president is complicit in, then it's easy for them to get to a place where they say, so he's not, you know, Trump's not any worse. Um, right. Which is, I think some of what you hear, Mm -hmm. uh, in these groups. Um, but so we we wanted to ask people like, okay, how do you think Trump would handle this? Um, and what we heard was a mixed bag when we asked, Mm -hmm. let's listen. It would be a disaster because (laughs) Foreign aid to Israel would increase, which I personally oppose. I think the aid should be a tenth of what it is, if not less, in my opinion. Kind of goes back to what Joshua was saying a little bit about, you know, the way that he feels about Ukraine. I kind of feel about the the situation, you know, there as far as not having the funding. And I feel like Trump would probably double the funding towards Israel. Aid would probably increase just with the observation of Trump being a more aggressive nationalist. But I think that the difference would probably be that he wouldn't like hide behind any of the language the Democratic Party is really weaponizing right now. I think they're weaponizing a lot of like social justice type language, condemning anti-Semitism or our hearts are saddened with the people like they're really laying it on thick with the language to make it seem as if this is a democratic issue and that it is in line with the voters' beliefs. But as a Jewish person who's been very involved with the Jewish Voice for Peace on my campus, which is a pro-Palestine group of Jewish activists, majority of the people arrested are proud anti-Zionist Jews. It's a community that I'm getting really close to the past couple of months. And it's just, it's insulting to read about Biden's support for the Jewish community. What does that mean to him when I'm here and hundreds and thousands of us are here disagreeing, saying, what about us? What are, what are you? It's insulting to not only our intelligence, but just like you think that you can hide behind this language. And I, I think that the difference probably, I don't think Trump would make it better in the slightest, but I think that he would at least admit what he was doing, which was exterminating people. I think the difference is that Trump actually stands up for his view, whatever it may be. Whereas I feel like Biden, he says like, oh, I support Palestine, but he'll never actually support Palestine. He may give like some extra aid, but at the same time, he'll support Israel in like their killing of civilians, which it seems like a very obvious thing. Like he can just stand very strongly and and oppose that and say, hey, Israel, cut it out. But like, I don't get why he won't do that. So at least in the international front, I feel like Trump, maybe he has some bad decisions, but at least he stands for like, this is my policy, I'm going to do it. There's no like if ands, but there's no middle ground. With Biden, he says he has a policy, but then he's always almost playing like both sides. You know, this is a this is a real feature of Dem groups when they talk about Trump. This is what I mean. It's not that they want their own strongman, but they do want their own person to fight. Like they talk about Trump with a certain kind of admiration for the way that he goes to bat for the his side yeah. in a way that it frustrates them uh, that Biden doesn't. You, you said something um, at the jump, though, that was really interesting to me about the way that Trump is is just starting to get asked about these things, mm-hmm. which is sort of an important note. The fact that like Donald Trump, Joe Biden has to account for everything that's happening in the world right now. Yeah. The economy, immigration, uh, Ukraine and Russia, Israel, Hamas, like that's a lot for him to have to deal with. And Trump just gets to like golf and take pot shots mm-hmm. uh, and be like, Everybody, nobody remembers COVID. You just remember the economy before right. COVID. Um, so when you talk about him getting asked about it and him kind of doing a something that could be interpreted uh, different ways by whoever was listening to it, uh, I think is an interesting and very true observation about the way that Trump talks about a lot of issues, abortion being another one where he can be real slippery um, and you're not always entirely sure what he's saying. But like, yeah. what what should Biden or... Kamala or the Democrats in general, like how do they help people understand your point that Trump would be worse, not just on this issue, but on any issue 
from their perspective as voters. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, the, the places Trump has been asked about this was uh, once by a uh, paper Sheldon Adelson, RIP, uh, mm-hmm. owns in Israel, and then again by Hugh Hewitt recently. And, you know, basically his line is like, as with everything bad that ever happens in the Biden administration, he says, it never would have happened if I was there. You know, October right. 7th, that would have happened. Russia never would have invaded Ukraine. Fill in the blank, right? So that's his kind of reflexive policy. Um, what's so interesting about what we just heard from those groups is if there is any issue where Joe Biden has been crystal clear about what he believes, it's this one, <laughs> you know? I mean, he flew to Israel to stand with Bibi Netanyahu on the tarmac in Jerusalem and gave him a big bear hug and he stood side by side him is like talked about his commitment to Israel has talked about, you know, getting their backs in the wake of this horrific terrorist attack. So it's interesting that like, yes, you're right that people want their own strong man, or at least someone to sort of be uh, more clarity, I guess, in policy generally. But um, part of me wonders if they just are not liking what they hear and they want to hear something else. I mean, the, the broader argument about what, Trump did while in office that was completely tilting the scales toward the Israeli side and not the Palestinians was they moved the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, which uh, was seen as a problem because the status of Jerusalem is something that's supposed to be negotiated in uh, in in conversations between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the process of creating a Palestinian state. They recognized uh, Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights which is a territory there. And then there were the Abraham Accords, which were these deals the Trump administration helped negotiate between essentially Gulf autocrats like the UAE and the Israeli government. Uh, usually they were uh, backed with some giant concession the U.S. gave in the, in, the, in the example of the UAE. It was a bunch of arms sales. Um, but the Palestinians were an, were an afterthought in that process. They were not even considered. They felt completely left behind. And when Trump finally did put forward, you know, this sort of like Jared Kushner half-assed peace plan, um, the the Palestinians got nothing. So I, I don't know that you can tell that broader story to kind of a normie voter because it's complicated and wonky and in, involves a bunch of uh, places and things that people have probably never heard of. Um, but I don't know. What do you, what do you think? What's, your, well, what's the best way? I mean, so it's funny because I spend all my time, not all my time, but most of my time thinking about how to peel sort of right-leaning independents and soft GOP voters away from Trump and to Biden. And I get sort of, um, and, and honestly, a swing voting group of soft Republicans talking about Joe Biden are not as hard on him as these progressive groups. Yeah. Um, and like, I would say even as a percentage matter, more of the voters in the swing groups I talk to when it's like, hey, the choices between Trump and Biden, they may have lots of negative things to say about Biden. But at the end of the day, they don't want to vote for Donald Trump. And the vast majority of these swing voters are still planning to vote for Joe Biden. And so I think I'm caught off guard a little bit by the Democratic groups um, because and and I'm very focused on this thing that I heard come up a bunch of times where they didn't think that Trump was worse because for, for all of like, uh, look, I actually could go on about why I think Joe Biden's been a pretty okay president, uh, all things being equal from a, me being kind of a squish Republican, uh, side, but like Mm -hmm. generally people don't feel that great about his presidency. Right. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, but the one thing that, that, people tend to get motivated about is the idea that, well, Donald Trump would be a catastrophe, whether it's because of democracy, whether it's because he's a, um, you know, lunatic, whether because he's hard right or he's empowered these hard right MAGA forces, they he try to coup. Um, so I just, I guess I find it pretty unnerving um, to, and, and when I see numbers come out of Michigan where Trump is up by four points, five points, I'm sitting there going, man, that is a 15 point swing from like 19 months ago. That seems crazy. And then you listen to these voters and you're right about the fact that like they were never like in love with Biden to begin Mm -hmm. with. But like my big fear is when I hear them saying, well, I don't think that it's Donald Trump is like categorically worse than Joe Biden anymore because of this. That is something that I think electorally, you sort of need people. You need people to be part of the anti-Trump 
coalition. You don't need them to be part of the pro-Joe Biden coalition. We have to have them be firmly set into the anti-Trump coalition. Um, and so I, I, I'm just worried they don't sound like, yeah, uh, you, I you know, too. I, I am too. I mean, listen, I think there are, there is some truth to the fact that I think progressives in the democratic party have been harder on Biden from the very beginning on a whole host of issues. And that's just sort of the, maybe that's an intra-democratic thing that we like to do to each other and we'll continue to do, it, but hopefully people will vote. I, I, on your broader point though, of like, how do we make the case that Trump will be worse? I'm not sure that you really can. I mean, part of this for me is just like, it boils down to when there's scary stuff on TV, people feel unsettled. This happened to us during the Obama administration. When the Arab Spring started, Every single night, you would see some embassy getting overrun. You would see massive protests. You would see people ch chanting death to America, right? There was just like, it was like scary, unsettling. It was a lot of change and people didn't like it. And I think the only way you can kind of address that is to address the policy problem at the root of the scary shit we're seeing on TV, which is getting to a ceasefire. Because if you can get to a ceasefire in Gaza, the Houthi rebels say they will stop firing missiles at ships in the Gulf Hopefully the uh, the Israelis will stop bombing the Iranians who are hanging out in, in Syria. Hopefully the, you won't see any more attacks by these Iranian proxy forces in Syria and Iraq. Like that's the totality of the story we're seeing, which is not just Gaza. It's not just about people who are who are being killed, civilians who are being killed who shouldn't be. It's about the entire region seeming inflamed. And people, when they think back to the Trump years, rightly or wrongly, are like, I don't remember that happening. Oh, let me just tell you, but one of the things that happens, and I hear this in the focus groups all the time from voters, uh, I mean, mostly on the, on, you know, Trump voters, but they'll say there were no wars in America when Donald Trump was president. Yep. And that's not true. America was at war when Donald Trump Very was president. So, yeah. America is not at war right now, but because we are, you know, obviously, uh, have, a great deal of interest in both the Israel Hamas conflict, uh, which feels for its own reasons closer to home than even the Ukraine Russia conflict or war. Um, you know, I, I just people feel like the world is in chaos now, even though we are not actually at war. And they feel like it was not in chaos when Trump was there, even though we were at war. Yeah. And I think part of that, frankly, like, look, I think people remember like two or three things from a presidency, right? And I think one of the things they probably remember is the last weeks of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and yeah. the nightmare that they saw on TV every single night, right? And so I think that chaos is still front yep. of mind for a lot of people. And I think that's when Joe Biden, frankly, I mean, I was looking at, uh, I probably shouldn't even say this because I think it was like a scroll observation, but it was a, a poll of really showing when when Biden's approval ratings sort of dropped oh, yeah. and never recovered. And it that's when it was, right? And yes. I will say, one of the things I remember from the focus groups at that time was the pullout from Afghanistan happened right around the time that Delta resurged. Uh, and so there was this moment of thinking that the pandemic had ended and then like the numbers got really bad again and people were really depressed about that. Those happened roughly at the same time, uh, but he didn't ever recover. Like he's never, yeah. he never bounced yeah. back up as things have gotten better. Um, and that's another, look again, like Donald Trump negotiated the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. It was like Mike Pompeo flying over to Qatar, talking to the Taliban guys, picking a date that we were getting. We were supposed to get out earlier than, than Biden got us out. So, you know, that's the frustrating context in all of this. And it's like, I, that's not to defend those final weeks and how things went and the intelligence failure of the Capitol following, uh, falling way before anyone was ready for it to. But, you know, you'll never be able to convince someone that actually these seeds were sown during the Trump administration, that he actually deserves blame for what, what we saw. Frankly, I think that every president that has served since, you know, 2001 deserves some blame for the policy in Afghanistan. In some ways, it was like a game of musical chairs. And, you know, Joe Biden, like, took a courageous step of trying to end what had become a forever war. And, you know, the, the ending was always going to be, um, you know, bloody and, and chaotic. Okay, we we're let's try to let's try to find a pony in this pile okay. here. Uh, so there's a little there's some uh, optimistic sound from this uncommitted group because while a lot of the folks in the Gen Z group, like I said, they were just ready to throw up their hands uh, and not do anything in November, many in this group still did understand what sitting out in November would mean. I definitely don't want Trump to win again, so I'll be like looking at the polls, and I know like polls are terrible ways to go but if it seems 
fairly safe. I may not vote for him. If it feels like it's a toss up, I'll vote for him. So depends on how badly he's doing, I guess. My concern about not voting for Biden, that would be like voting for Trump. So I think we're really hurting the Democratic Party if we don't vote for him. If there was a viable another candidate, a good one, I'd consider it. But that's what happened when, <laughs> you know, when Clinton lost. Everyone's like, oh, like, I don't need to go out and vote. So many Democrats didn't vote. Like, what happened there? Like, people didn't vote and Trump won. It's going to come down to what feels worse to me, not voting or voting for Joe Biden. And that's just unfortunate that it's the way it's going to be. But I voting is very personal and it's going to come down to whatever sits right with me and my community of like what feels like the best thing I can do with the privileges that I have. I think if I had to pick right now, I would probably not vote. Ooh. Mm. Um. So, but, but we talked about that young, young woman earlier yeah. and she was in the minority of this group. Like, yeah. the, I, I, and so I, I wonder if your sense of where the Democrats are, uh, do you feel like, look, the, and we sort of started with this part of the conversation. Do you feel like they wanted to register their dissatisfaction with this particular war and this particular set of policies um, so that they could be heard and that over the next seven months, as they sort of grapple with the reality of another Donald Trump term that these people come come home and ultimately get there. Yeah, I will look if they don't come home, they at least think really hard about the choice. Like I, the, the entire group uh, was they were not the most committed Biden voters, but they were people that were thinking hard about the choice. And that alone, I think, made me feel a little better. I really think that almost every election is about what issue is the most salient at the end. You know, if like if the 2016 election is two weeks earlier, Hillary Clinton probably wins. Uh, if the salient issue in this election at the very end is something to do with immigration, we're probably not in a great place. If the Gaza war is still raging, we are absolutely screwed. But if, you know, you continue to there was a great jobs report out today. We're recording yep. this Friday, April 5th. Um, if the economy continues to improve. Uh, I think you will I think it's a lagging indicator in the polls. I think you will start to see more and more people feeling better about their economic situation and just kind of the the vibes based argument about what they're hearing and seeing from friends will be better. So I, I, I have confidence that uh, all is not lost, that we have time to make the argument that this is a 50 50 election uh, and that's just how it's going to be. And that's not like the most hopeful <laughs> um, assessment, but I do think it's it's just sort of the reality of politics in America in 2024. Yeah. And I guess this is where I found these groups so unsettling is that I spend so much time, like I said, thinking about the center right groups. And, you know, we also write when we're taping this is shortly after when no labels finally decided to pack Thank up their uh, failed, uh, very silly attempt that would have been nothing but a, a spoiler uh, for Donald Trump. And I sit there thinking like, OK, we, we got this. Like, and I, I listen to these sort of um, people who voted for John McCain and Mitt Romney say that, you know what, Biden's fine, fine. It's all f like fine. I'll take him over this lunatic Trump and I start to feel better. Uh, and then I listen to young Dems, you know, young progressives. And I'm like, uh, they, they and, and, and part of what's interesting about the younger folks that sometimes because we're old now, I don't know if you know this, but oh, yeah. we're old, Feeling um, it. The and it's partly because we've lived three lifetimes uh, through the Trump years um, and it's aging all of us. But when you listen to the young people talk about these, you realize like they don't remember what time when things were just normal and we mm -hmm. didn't like they didn't they weren't alive pre 9-11 where like things were just kicking along and we were arguing about, I don't know, like explicit warning labels on CDs or yeah. whatever we were doing in the 90s. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, worrying about Y2K. Uh, and and so and, and they have like real like Donald Trump is to them not an aberration or or is not like this uh, crazy. Like He's been in their line of sight now. Right. He's been part of politics for almost a decade. And so for many of them, um, he's just not seen the way like we see him, which is just like so deviant from what we might expect out of a politician. Um and so I, and, and they haven't seen us win a war 
and they haven't seen us do foreign policy particularly well. Uh, and so I guess I, I, I'm just so aware that young people have a different window of time through which they've experienced, uh, American foreign policy, um, and politics in general. I mean, I think I, I hear similar things. I hear a lack of faith in institutions writ large. I hear a lack of faith in politics to solve the problem. I mean, I think that's sort of the, at the root of it is they think, you know, one or the other, like it's not going to make a difference to me. I think obviously the information space is completely scrambled. I'm not, I don't want to blame TikTok, but I think people are getting more information and news from unvetted sources than vetted sources or, you know, sort of professional media. Um, and they're also getting fed it and hearing things from their friends. So there's a, there can be a bit of a, a herd mentality, right? Sort of like you, you, all your friends are talking about one thing, but they're not just talking about what's happening in Gaza. They're setting the uh, threshold for caring at saying it's a genocide, which, yeah. you know, is sort of like the maximalist criticism. It's sort of the worst. It's the worst thing you could ever accuse a country of doing. And my yes. view on this is that the the ICJ, the, the international courts are going to take their time and evaluate evidence and make a decision and, and go forward. But there is sort of a sense that if you, know, you see this a lot on social media, if you don't call it a genocide, you don't actually care. And I thought that's the part of this that I find so frustrating because I think actually, no, you can be you can oppose this war. You can march. You can rally. You can call your elected officials and ask them you know, to cut off a, a aid or you know, assistance to Israel to push for a ceasefire, et cetera, et cetera, without declaring it's a genocide. Right. So um, that, that's, I think, the challenge. It's sort of this this broken information space. It's a younger generation that I think understandably uh, has a lot of lo has lost faith in <laughs> institutions and in people in power. And look, if I was like in high school or college during covid and I was watching the press conferences we watched where Donald Trump is talking about injecting bleach or whatever. And you're like, these are the people in charge. I mean, I'd feel the same way. Yeah, you know what, just as the last matter, I was just sitting here listening to you talk, thinking about, you know, we, in 2008, uh, when you were, we were all young and idealistic, and uh, we would have been uh, 28 years old, you and I, uh, and you were working for Obama, going into those years of hope. I was a big McCain fan, but I also remember, what I remember most about that election is how much I felt good about either person winning. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was just like, these, either one of these are both good men. Um, I have more policy disagreements with Barack Obama, but I also had a substantive one with John McCain in terms of uh, gay marriage. And so I was just like, I'm going to be happy no matter what happens. And like these young people have never had an experience like that where you sort of felt like America was going to be fine mm -hmm. either way. Um, and I guess I, I lament that for them. OK, yeah. one last thing that I found really interesting uh, from this group. Uh, we tend to think of Gretchen Whitmer, or I do, uh, as being kind of a middle of the party hybrid Democrat and not especially moderate or progressive. But in this very progressive group, uh, Whitmer was like, people liked her a lot. Yeah. Let's listen. I had to deal with New York governors for 10 years and New York governors, no matter who it is, it's insane. Like it's just the absolute worst people possible. And so I actually really like Rachel Whitmer. It's a refreshing change moving to Michigan, having like a somewhat normal governor of all the governors I've had. She's, she's one of the, the better ones. People tend to shy away from strong, assertive women. So that's really why people don't like her because she's, she's, a good thinker. She's independent. She's strong. She's assertive. And, you know, in our society, women and men sometimes shy away from that. But I like her. I think she's done a good job as far as the roads. I mean, every time I go out anywhere, the roads are being worked on. and It is inconvenient, but she is holding that promise for a lot of areas. There's still work to be done because you have infrastructure that was ripped apart for eight years when Snyder was in office and didn't maintain anything, but she's done a lot. She is more moderate, I would say, but she's also more firm in her decisions. Like it feels like she's more committed and is very goal-based as opposed to even someone like, I'll just compare her because a lot of people have compared her to Jennifer Granholm. And I think she's been more effective than Granholm. 
in my opinion. I definitely think she's more moderate than I am. I think that any politician, I think to be a politician, you have to be more moderate mm -hmm. than I am. But I do think that she's doing her job as a state governor, which is to improve the lives of the people that live in the state that she serves. And it feels like she serves the citizens of Michigan. And you can't say that about everybody. So I will give her that. I appreciate that. I'm frequently seeing updates that she is passing constitutions to protect all types of people that live in Michigan. And I, I do, I respect her a lot for that, for doing things for the people that she's supposed to serve. Big Gretch 2028, what do you think? I, I, I mean, first of all, it seems like it's awesome to have a trifecta because <laughs> you, yeah, get, you totally. get to do things and pass things and people remember them and, you know, they read the news and they think you've done a good job. I also do love that clearly, I think uh, the the young man moderating the focus group uh, mentioned that I guess Whitmer had like a campaign about ad about paving the roads, which was repeated back by some of the people on the panel. So, look, hey, I guess advertising does work. That's another nice thing for people like us to hear who who want to tell a message in the story. But I mean, like, you know, back to your just real quick on the point you're making about McCain and Obama. I guess I just didn't realize how lucky I was to work for Obama at the time and be inspired and excited every day to go to work. And I had the same feeling you did about John McCain. Obviously, I was hard opposed to a lot of his views on social policy and uh, super opposed to the Iraq war. But he seemed like a good man. And I wonder, Biden didn't really get to run a real campaign in 2020 because of the pandemic. And I wonder if that had a long term cost in terms of his connection with voters who just didn't see him in their state. Yeah, that's such an interesting uh, point. I bring this up in a different way all the time, which is only to say that he didn't have to campaign last time. Like we just we haven't seen him campaign. And this time he's older and having to do it now. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I do because you hear it all the time in the focus groups and especially in the Democratic focus groups where people are like, I just don't see him. I mean, I've said they say this about him and Kamala, uh, where there yeah. just has not been that sense of like, I know him, I've seen him, he's showing up all the time. I do think, though, that some of that is the way that Trump hijacked our brains um, in yes. terms of just like being in our face 24 uh, seven to the point where like. We didn't used to think that the president, we had to hear from him on literally Everything. every issue. At, oh, is there a basketball game? What does the, does the president think? Uh, you know, what does the president think about no label? You know, like, it's just insane the amount of input now people are used to getting from their their presidents. So um, I think about that all the time just because we, we everyone said, you know, oh, I just want politics to be boring and normal again. And then it no, becomes it boring and normal again. They absolutely do not. Everyone was addicted to the like political fentanyl of the Trump tweets, whether you loved him or you hated him, you paid attention. It was like Howard Stern back in the day, right? Like there is something about that that people like just because it it's interesting. Yeah, I think that's true. And I actually think that part of even this rematch uh, is like people think it's kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> and like that, that's why they're uh, as much as they loved it when it was um, new and exciting. But now it's like. Oh, okay, we're doing this again. Yep. Um, and they're just older and the same people. But that's why, you know, can I just say, so the, I've done a lot of focus groups in Michigan because it's a swing state. People care a lot about the roads. Yeah. The roads have been uh, a major issue. And clearly she's got some infrastructure dollars to pay with now, uh, to play with now. But I guess I wonder, my big, one of my big complaints about sort of just the way Democrats have been running the campaign so far for Joe Biden is the lack of surrogates. Like they do have these popular sort of moderate governors, but in swing states and and you don't see them that yeah. much out there sort of like bucking it for Joe Biden. Let's talk about, look, he gave us all this money and where he's helping us with the roads. Uh, how, <sighs> like, why not? What's going on? Listen, this is a perennial problem and perennial complaint. I'm sure it would make a difference on the margin as a recovering uh, communication staffer, both on campaigns and in the White House this shit always drove me crazy. Like, I, I think part of the problem was you pass a big bill like the CHIPS Act or the you know, Obamacare, or the Recovery Act, and it takes years to get implemented, to get, start the spending, to be felt in the communities. And it's just, it's not a fast process. Like it took what, 15 years for uh, <laughs> the Affordable Care Act to be popular finally. And now it is, and, and people like it. And it's actually, Republicans are, are getting penalized for running against it. So yes, I do think, uh, that Biden could up the surrogate operation. I think they have a lot 
in the last six months, there is a huge sort of deficit of knowledge among voters. But I remember early on in the Biden administration, they were like, we've learned the lessons of the Recovery Act from 2009, and we're going to get out there and sell these ideas, and people are going to know what they're doing in their communities. And I was like, good luck, because you know what? The press doesn't give a shit, and they're not going to cover it. So you can get out there all you want, but it's going to be very hard. Uh, and it has, it is, it has been hard. Um, well, we're going to leave it there. Tommy Vitor, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. All right. We're going to say goodbye to Tommy and we're actually going to do a little bit of a new segment, uh, cause my producer is demanding it, uh, where we ask a couple of questions that you guys have sent in. Uh, these are kinds of the, these are the kind of questions we get all the time from our listeners and we're going to keep doing these little mailbag uh, things in the future every now and then. So Susan wrote in and said, do you ever simply point out a fact to participants? For example, Joe Biden promised student debt relief and didn't deliver. He did enact an executive order, but the Supreme Court overruled it. And does it or would it ever make a difference in the participants' perceptions? So this is a question, a version of a question I get a lot, which is, do you ever push back when people say things that are wrong in the focus groups? And the answer is basically no. Uh, and sometimes we'll say, if we think it's important to understand what is persuasive to people, we might uh, introduce you know, relevant information that we think they need to hear to understand if that's the kind of thing where people say, okay, that makes me change my mind. But, but generally, the way that we do focus groups and the reason that we do focus groups, right, I want to listen to 10 people tell me what they think so that I can go convince 10 million people of something, right? It is research. Uh, it is our, we're not trying to convince those 10 people in the room of anything. We're just trying to understand the way they think about an issue, not just what they think about it, but the reasons they think those things and what shaped that, uh, you know, where do they get that information? And so we approach these much more with an attitude of curiosity than one of trying to do persuasion. But I use the information that we gather to do persuasion work in the advocacy work that I do, whether it's Republican voters against Trump or Republicans for Ukraine, or just to better understand the way voters are thinking on certain issues. Donnell asks, how do I join the pool of candidates for your focus group? So uh, we don't go around and hand select the people for the focus groups. Um, we use market research firms uh, that, you know, go ha have like big lists of people uh, who like to participate in focus groups. Not many, most of them aren't political focus groups. Most of them are, uh, you know, they have people come in and they show them, I don't know, like different cat food bags. And these people are all cat owners and they say, which one makes you want to buy it more? Um, and so, you know, people are, when they, when they come in, they often don't know that we're going to be talking about politics. Um, but when they are, they're usually, you know, pretty engaged uh, by that. And we always, we do a, a lot of screening up front, meaning we ask certain questions um, so that these uh, research firms that basically have these lists of people who will participate in focus groups can go find us the kinds of people that we're looking for. So our thing might say, um, you know, that we want to make sure they are uh, they have a college education, that they live in Pennsylvania, that they are all women. Um, or we might uh, have a screener that asks, you know, um, we want people who voted for Trump twice, uh, who live in Michigan, uh, but who rate him as doing a very bad job so that we can think about who might be uh, persuadable among two-time Trump voters. But uh, we work with outside companies that help us uh, help us recruit uh, people for focus groups. And like, that's what they do. They find people uh, for focus groups and then we conduct them and moderate them. So I hope that shed a little light on what we do with the focus groups. Remember to send your mailbag questions to focusgroupatthebulwark.com. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to the Focus Group podcast. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe, and we will see you all next week.